Hello everyone, this is Tae Kwan from Keene, New Hampshire, and this is your Ripe Global Implantology Case Review. I would like to share case of Margaret. She was referred by a general practitioner regarding needing implant on maxillary right central incisor edentulous area. Patient presented to general practitioner with large periapical lesion with failing endo on this area, and general dentist extracted the tooth, uh, removed the periapical lesion, and placed the bone graft. And patient ended up in my chair for implant placement. Now, when you look at the profile of her case, you can see there is some vertical ridge resorption as evident by gingival recession on the adjacent teeth, especially on the lateral incisor. And when you look at occlusally, you can clearly see that there is a buccal concavity. This is not surprising because on the literature, when you do extraction and socket grafting, believe it or not, you still lose about 15% of alveolus width. If you don't graft, you use about 40% of the alveolar width. So it's not surprising to see some buccal concavity on this area. Now, is the site ready for dental implant? The graft has been done more than six months ago. And the question is, what kind of bone do we have in this area? Conventionally, we'll rely on CT scan or periapical radiograph to determine the quality of the bone. However, the reason why I want to share this case today is because you cannot rely on radiograph all the time. The reason is, what is the material that we use as bone graft is usually mineralized bone powder. So if you put those mineralized structures into the socket and then you take x-ray, it's going to appear like it's bone because you technically put some bone in, but it doesn't really tell you how well these bone grafts are osseointegrated into the socket. So a lot of time, the decision has to be remade when you open up the flap, like so. So when I elevate the flap, you, you may wonder, that's really nice bone. But when you look a little bit closely, you can see that there's a little, little gray, bluish area. And a lot of time, this is the residual granulation tissue or fibrous encapsulated graft particle that are not osseointegrated into the existing bone. I used a mini curette. It's called Hirschfeld file. Um, and I used a mini curette to trace this granulation tissue and then remove completely. And when you do that, you can clearly see that there is significant hole in the alveolus where the socket used to be. And the depth of this, just to give you an idea, was about 8 to 10 millimeter, which is the full depth of the socket. Do we place bone graft here? Absolutely not. Because there is a defect on alveolus, and then she already had a history of not taking full bone graft. I want to graft this side again, have a nice base and repair this buccal concavity and convert it into buccal convexity. So graft has been placed, and then now I'm going to fold this membrane over and stabilize it using periosteal sutures. So these periosteal sutures start from the palatal aspect, go over the membrane buccally, grab the periosteum, and then come back to the palatal, and then we make the knots. And then you can see there are two periosteal suture that is compressing the membrane and bone graft against, against the recipient area. And then this mucosal flap here will be coronally advanced to achieve the primary closure. Like so, and like so. Achieving the primary closure is extremely important, especially when you do large bone augmentation. The reason is, the, clo the more closed the flap is, there's a less chance for bacteria to get into this membrane and bone graft material. Most likely, the reason why this Margaret's case initially had granulation tissue to begin with is probably because of A, maybe some of the granulation tissue was not completely removed during the extraction, 
A lot of time when a patient present with a large periwinkle collision, I recommend raising a flap completely so that you can expose the defect and clean out everything. Two, it could be when graft was done, membrane and bone graft has been purposely exposed or left exposed, and these bone graft and membrane could have been contaminated during the healing, which may have caused the granulation tissue formation. Another tip that I want to share here is you can clearly see my incision, crestal incision, is on the palatal, not mid-crestal. The reason is, even though I achieved the primary closure in this case, there is a chance that this flap may open up. If I place this incision mid-crestal, when it opens up, guess what happened? I expose a lot of bone graft, especially on the buccal aspect where I need bone graft. By placing this incision palatally away from I need to grow bone, which is mainly buccal, even if the flap opens up, changing from healing by primary intention to secondary intention, there's a less chance for bone graft on the buccal to be contaminated during the healing process. So when you're making the incision, you always have to remember, A, how you're going to close it, but B, also potential complication they can raise. Lastly, when I do this kind of bone grafting, large augmentation case, I always tell patient ahead that there will be significant swelling on the face, bruising sometime, and significant pain. So you always want to let patient know ahead so that they are well prepared. I hope you learned something from this case, and I'll see you for your next uh, case review very soon. Take care.